Good day, folks. Good day to where you are. And this is another entry to my YouTube channel. This is Angelo Lorenzo. And today we have a very special guest because he's an author, he's a writer, and he's also a father. Recently, he has become a father. And um, I'll be introducing him formally. Mark Lois is a writer and author from Cardiff, Wales, United Kingdom. He published his debut novel, Feral Snow, on Amazon in September 2020. Career-wise, he is an educator for children with special abilities, and now he is a father and spent his free time writing fiction in thriller and fantasy genre. And good to have you here in the in my um, recent vlog entry, Mark. Thank you for being. Thank you for invite. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to, uh, to chatting. It's great. So, um, the Feral Snow has been receiving um, <laughs> rave reviews so far on both Goodreads and Amazon. Can you tell me what was the idea behind um, your uh, debut novel? Yeah, sure. So Feral Snow originally was going to be more of a commercial thriller. Um, it started out as a, a man who went to the Arctic for various reasons. He had a, a, an unhappy marriage and, and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And whilst he was there caught in a blizzard, he saw a feral child who was out, you know, um, sort of living with wolves mm -hmm. and it became it became something that was a very very fast paced very sort of you know just bam 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 there's lots of action that was going on mm -hmm. and then I kind of I spoke to a writer friend of mine uh, Anna and Anna read through it and sort of said to me that this isn't this isn't you this isn't what you do mm -hmm. what you do is you look at the human psyche and you look at um you're quite in depth with um you know, behavior and, and, and why we do certain things and the things that we do, and especially things that affect our past. Right. And so Feral Snow sort of came, was born from that conversation that I had with her. I already had a, a preconceived idea about what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody set in the Arctic and, and, and all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, it, it, it kind of came from that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm always very interested in people's pasts mm -hmm. and how that then affects their future. Um, and so Paul, who was a freelance cameraman um, from Cardiff, Wales, obviously, he goes to the Arctic because he is terrified about becoming a father for the first time. And the reason why he's terrified of becoming a father and that responsibility is because he had a pretty traumatic, abusive past. Mm -hmm. um, his father was abusive towards him. Mm -hmm. And so... I was very interested in him as the character. And I, re I just remember the, the, the opening scene mm -hmm. um, of Paul's journey mm -hmm. is him, him on a boat and he's uh, drifting out to sea um, and he's going towards this, this really big, expansive Arctic waste mm -hmm. land. And he was carrying a sonogram with him. Um, and that it just it just blew up from there. The whole idea of of Paul being stuck in the Arctic and him trying to find himself. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, well, what can I do that will make him really click, jolt out of his status quo of oh, I'm really you know mm -hmm. down. I'm, I'm I've got no hope. You know, I'm, I'm sort of stuck in this responsibility loop kind of thing, and I'm I, I'm not going to do a good job of it. So I thought, what can I jolt? What can I do to jolt him out of that? And the natural thing was to throw a child in there. Um, and yeah, that's where Feral Snow came from. He got stuck in a chasm. And then a character, a very fun character called Nanny, mm -hmm. Nanook um, for long, um, falls into the chasm with him. Um, and from there, just the, just the friendship is, is, I think, is just amazing. Yeah. Um, and the way the character arc of Paul mm -hmm. um, and the way he grows um, mm -hmm. because of Nanny specifically, was was what drew me to him and the story as a as a whole. Mm -hmm. I see some um, similarities between the background of um, Paul, your main character, and you as an author. Um, so he's also from Cardiff. Um, he also experiences, um, you know, dealing with children because you're also an educator. Um, he also experiences that um, relationship, that bond with Nanny. Um, how personal um, is the novel for you, despite being a thriller? It's very personal. Um, as you as you said at the beginning of doing the introduction, I am a first time father. Um, my baby Freddie is currently five and a half weeks old. Mm -hmm. um, 
And yeah, I was pretty scared about becoming a dad um, and for you know, my own reasons and stuff. Um, it was, it was personal trying to d delve deep into uh, Paul's psyche and, and why he is the way that he is. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the stuff that, that came from him, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that he was very um, inward, the fact that he was very withdrawn within himself. He wanted to hide things like his deafness and stuff. He, he yeah. hid it mm -hmm. from the world. It's an open and and that was something that I, I could probably relate to because I'm quite withdrawn myself. Um, and the fact that he's from Cardiff and, and everything and that, 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 you know, it's about that. That's something that I could obviously relate to. And that a lot of people talk about, especially with debut authors and stuff, they talk about um, writing what you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I agree with that to some extent. Um, you should write what you, you know, of course, um, but don't be afraid to write what you want to know or want to explore. Um, and the things that you're passionate about, the things that you're interested in. And Paul as a, as a character, his, his entire history was something that was utterly fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it led me to do a lot of research into him as a character. Um, and yeah, his, his deafness as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that I work with deaf children was something as well that, that sort of just um, drew me to him a little bit more, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... I wanted to give him that representation of deafness as well. Right. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a it was a really it was a really personal journey for me, um, especially considering what it was and what it became. Um, I I feel like as an author, I had an arc myself as well as he did. I had a journey of change. Um, I looked at um, how I can make him more of a real character with layers and not just this two D character that you put on a page. Mm -hmm. One tragic um, thing that I found in, in the novel is what I found in the um, novel's description where um, the, the, the description describes Paul as um, having been, um, having become uh, unilaterally deaf because of his abusive father. So, um, yeah. so that's a tragic um, uh, thing that I, that I also found out in the novel. Um, is it, like, how true is it that most, um, uh, children with disabilities or children with different um, abilities have been um, affected that way because of, you know, abusive parents, um, abusive env environment, or like, um, is it common though to to um, encounter children who are a mix, who, whose um, different abilities come from abusive environments? Not necessarily, no. Um, you obviously there's there's the possibility there's the chance. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of deaf children though are either born deaf deaf or are through illness or you know meningitis or for whatever reason. Um, there's so many reasons why a child could become deaf. It's not necessarily because of a, an abusive past or an abusive background. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like that that was something that I I put into the story because. Paul needed a reason why he is the way that he is. Um, there was a seed there that I planted very early on within the story, um, you know, that he was, he was deaf and that he was ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. And you, then you've got to look at why is he ashamed of it? Um, and then he's ashamed of it because his dad's never fully accepted the way that he is. Um, and his dad's relationship and his dad's attitude towards Paul resulted in the way that he is. And it's, it's that cyclical effect of constantly going around and around, you know, you have the abuser become the abusee, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and that was something that, that drew me to him as a character. Um, and it's something that I felt was very important to highlight as well. Um, but there are these children in the world who, who do become differently abled um, because of their past, um, because of environmental issues. Um, not that this isn't, I don't think it's as common though, um, yeah, I don't think it's as common. I think it's uh, it's something that I put into the story myself. That's a very um, promising representation because we always tend to see um, novels with that genre having you know normal characters with um, uh, abilities that are like uh, perfectly functioning, but then we we see Paul um, as a main character who, despite or like in spite of his um, different abilities, he is able to you know, overcome his past and um, 
go through the challenge that um, he has to go through in the plot, um, being trapped in that chasm. So um, when you wrote the first draft, um, Mark, did you originally intend to self-publish it or did, um, did you have it in mind to um, send it to a major publisher or like look for an agent? Um, what was the mm. process like? So the commercial thriller that I wrote to start with, um, I did have the idea of sending that to two agents. Um, mm. I felt like it was it was a well written commercial thriller. To be honest, I, I felt that it was something that could be published um, by traditional publishers, um, and so that was the route for a very long time. You know, with other books that I've written as well, that was the route that I wanted to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was always told that th- the same thing though is that um, either not right now, you know, it's not the right time, or um, the characters are amazing, you write really well, but the story isn't necessarily there or the plot isn't complicated enough or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And then I, when, I, when I rewrote um, Feral Snow, I wrote it into the, the, the story it is currently. And I sent it off to this amazing agent who I have a load of respect for, um, who runs her own company and stuff. And she requested the full manuscript, which is, which is great. She requested it within two days, um, which is... Is, is amazing, which clearly shows that, you know, obviously there was something there that she she saw which she liked. Mm-hmm. But then she said, uh, when she responded, it was rejected. And she said that the you write beautifully, the characters are really engaging, but the plot wasn't as complicated as I would have liked it to have been. Mm-hmm. And it was previous, it was, it was similar to previous advice that I had before. Mm-hmm. And then I, I, I remember I reread Feral Snow from the beginning all the way through. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, I, I love it the way that it is. I love these characters. I love Paul's journey. I love Nanny as, as, as a person who she is. I love the adventure that they go on together. Um, I love the entire thing. And I wasn't necessarily willing to, to compromise um, that sort of the heart of the story, which is what I wanted it to be, which was Paul's journey um, and breaking that cycle of abuse. And I felt like if I, if I had try to change it too much to meet the needs of agents or traditional publishers or what have you, then I would have, I would, I would have compromised. I would have, I would have taken away something special from the story of, of what I think it is. So, um, yeah, it, 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 early on, I did kind of want to go down that route, but then more as I, as a sort of, I, th- I think as I grew more and more as a person, as well as a writer, as well as someone who understood, the market and, and stuff. I made the decision in the to self-publish this regardless of um, whether I get hundreds of rejections for it or not. Um, and so, yeah, I just made the, I made the decision last summer, I think it was, so about July. Um, and then, yeah, it was, it was published. Um, the paperback was, was out in September, but then the ebook was out in, uh, in October, October 1st. Okay. So... I, yeah, I think it was it was a conscious decision after I really really thought about it because you know very early on as a writer you're told, especially if you go into bookshops and stuff, you're told that you you should be in a bookshop, you should be you know published by a big publisher, you know Harper Collins or, or Penguin, Random House, what have you. Um, but ultimately, you kind of need to look at your own situation, look at the product that you've got, look at the story that you've got, and say to yourself, is this something that I want people to read? Mm-hmm. Is it something that I want to share? If it is something that you want to share, regardless of whether um, you get hundreds of rejections or not, mm-hmm. put it out there. Let people enjoy it. Let people, you know, read your words and are impacted by them. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, if you if you don't and you just sort of go, okay, well, I'm going to work on the next one, then that story is locked away in a drawer and, and those words are never going to see the light of day, which is sad. It's mm-hmm. really sad. So I'd encourage anyone who... Yeah, if you want to go down the, the traditional publisher routes, mm-hmm. it's fine, that's cool. Yeah, do, do your thing. But at the same time, don't be afraid. Don't be um, shamed into thinking that your story isn't worth sharing with people because it is. Mm-hmm. It always is, regardless of what, you know, what genre you've written, whatever it is. If you think that it is the best product that you can put out there, if you think it's the best story that you can share with people, mm-hmm. do it. There's, there's no harm in it. Because ultimately, if, if an agent looks at your self-published career and, and you know, they're 
a bit iffy about it, then that's not the that's not the agent for you because they should be invested in you as a person. They should be invested in your writing, not your backlog of, of stories that you you've decided to share with people. Right. And at the end of the day, it's always the author's decision to choose which route or like which path um, they should go, like traditional yeah. publishing or um, self-publishing. And I think both of them works fine because we have authors who are really excel, uh, um, achieving great things with traditional publishing. And that's the, that's the uh, main road for many authors. And then there are those who also excelled in traditional publishing. We have the likes of, um, I think the author of The Martian originally self-published his book. And Andrea, yeah. Yeah, and then it became a bestseller while it was still being self-published. And then, you know, that's how the major publisher picked it up and republished it. Yeah, I'll just say though that, um, so Andrea was, um, was a one in, in a billion shot at, at doing what he did. Mm. He was publishing his his stories fan fiction. He was publishing his fan publishing his fan fiction online for people to read, you know, at their leisure. And I love Andy Weir. I think his his stories are absolutely amazing. Martian is one of my favorite yeah. books ever. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think there's there's some similarity between The Martian and, and Carol Snow, just because you know you're bound to draw that inspiration from somewhere, aren't you? Wow. But it was it was a one in one billion shot for Andy Weir that he was self published. He did very little in terms of marketing, as far as I'm aware, anyway. Mm -hmm. And then he just blew up. Mm -hmm. So what I will say is, yes, of course, you know, anyone chooses to do whatever they want to do. You know, if, you, if you're an author and you think traditional publishing is the way that you want to go and that's all you want to do, <clears throat> that's, that's fine. That's, you know, you do your thing, man. It's cool. Right. But at the same time, if you're going to go down the self-publishing route, just be prepared to do the work. Be prepared to know that you are not going to be an overnight success. Mm -hmm. unless you are an Andy Weir. Um, and that's the same with traditional publishing as well, though. You go into a, you, you have a debut novel, you go to a traditional publisher, they're not going to put as much money into it as you would like them to in terms of marketing and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a fine balance. You need, to, you need to decide what is right for you. But I'd say it's not necessarily just what's right for you. It's what's right for your story. Mm -hmm. It's what's right for your book. There's a lot of literary fiction out there. There's a lot of books out there that have a lot of depth and have a lot of meaning and the character development is, is so well-rounded and beautifully written that they kind of, they're kind of commercialized a bit because that's what, you know, that's what's going to make money for the publisher. Right. So look at, your, look at your book, look at your story. What do you want to do with it as an author? And then choose your path because it, it's, it's, completely, it's completely individual. It's unique, dependent on you. Just know that you're either way but if you go down the self publisher you're going to have to put a little bit of effort into it and a little bit of heart and soul into what it is that you want to do you know right. so um when you self published the, the feral snow um mark uh like which performed better um in terms of sales the physical books or the ebooks <clears throat> the ebooks massively and that's that's just because there's a price difference. There's a huge price difference, and and also when you when you self-publish through KDP and um, Kindle Direct Publishing, mm -hmm. it takes a little while for the, the, the book to be printed because it's print on demand. So it takes a little while for the book to be printed, and then for that to be shared, um, you know, to be sent out. So a lot of people are a bit impatient, I think, especially in the world that we live in at the moment. And I especially think that during the pandemic, you know, my <laughs> Feral Snow came out during the pandemic, you know, there's no escaping it. Um, I think a lot of people obviously couldn't go to bookshops anymore. Um, and I think people were reading at a faster rate and obviously there's obviously storage and all that stuff. And everyone sort of bought Kindle paper whites and, you know, um, products and stuff. So you use, so yeah, overwhelmingly the eBooks have done a lot better. And obviously there's a lot of um, promotional stuff that you can do on, um, KDP that you know with an ebook that you can't necessarily do with a paperback. You can adjust the price of paperback, which is great. Mm -hmm. But with an ebook, you can run like you know free book sales and, and all that stuff, which coincided with a blog tour that I did um, just before Christmas. And I saw obviously it was it was free, so you know, but the, the, the sales spiked then, um, and I saw a, a huge engagement um, in terms of readership when I did that. So that's great. So congrats on that. Um, you. Earlier you mentioned. Um, about Andy Weir from uh, the author of The Martian. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of um, authors also like 
excelling both in traditional and um, self-publishing um, paths. Uh, who are your um, in, uh, who are the authors who have inspired you to write? I was thinking about this beforehand, and, and I, I, there's, a, there's such a long list because I don't necessarily read. I will read the same author over and over again if I love them, but I read so many different authors at the same time, and the books that I, you know, I, I'm very picky about the books that I, I like to read because I'm such a slow reader. It takes me it takes me a good month to get through a decent book. <laughs> so. Stephen King obviously is, is, a, is a massive influence and an inspiration for, for my writing. Um, and his book, Misery, features in Beryl Snow. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's Stu Turton, who I think is, you know, Devil in the Dark Water and The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Cracking books, just absolutely amazing in terms of twists and in terms of um, whodunits and stuff. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, Matt Veselovsky, who uh, is doing the Six Stories um, mm -hmm. series at the moment. His new book, Deity, has just come out. I haven't read it yet, but the previous ones in terms of voice, they're absolutely amazing. So it's told through Scott King, who is a podcaster, and he looks at previous crimes that have sort of gone a bit cold. Mm -hmm. um, and there's one particular one called Changeling that he wrote, and the, it was based in North Wales. And as someone who is who lives in Wales, Hearing, hearing the dialect, the voice, the, the, the character speak and everything about it screamed Welsh. And it was just a bit, because he's from the Northeast, mm -hmm. um, Northeast of England, he's from Newcastle. Um, so that, that was like, in terms of voice, that was just, I think it, he's just got it spot on there. And the stories themselves are, are great as well. And then there's uh, CJ Tudor, who, um, you know, the chalk man and, and stuff, great writer as well, um, really love her books. Um, but the, probably the one that I, I could know, there's one that I, so I, me and my fiance, we went to um, Lanzarote a few years ago. And there's a book that I just picked up in the, the airport because I needed something to read on the, on the airplane because I, I don't like flying. Um, it was called My Absolute Darling by uh, Gabriel Talent. Mm -hmm. That features heavily in Feral Snow. Um, and it is one of the best books I've ever read in my entire life. It is so beautiful it's so raw it's so engaging and it talks about subjects that is taboo to be talked about mm -hmm. but it does it in such a way that is so powerful that you can't help but feel affected by it um, and I still think about his writing and, and that story mm. in any kind of adventure that I go into in terms of writing um, and I read somewhere that well, I listened to an interview with him and said, he said that it took him years to write it. And he's such a perfectionist with it. He had all of the papers laid out on the floor and everything and he had them all in order and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I just, I don't know, that, that book itself is, is just something special. So I do highly recommend that if anyone is going to read anything of the list that, of authors that I just mentioned, go read the Gabriel Talents, uh, My Absolute Darling, because it will, Oh, it's just amazing. That's interesting. Yeah, because um, many authors these days have their own like different styles, and then um, somehow when they when they um, like write a new book, they would like integrate the same styles, and also they have unique um, um, take on things. Like um, earlier, you mentioned also about Stephen King. He has like by far the most books that I can like, like I can think of. Like when it comes to authorship. Um, He's one of the the um, many writers or authors out there who's published a lot. Like I think he has over sixty books and he, written all by himself. Yeah. Because I know that there are also <laughs> authors out there who write books, but then they are like write plenty of books, but then they, they are um, teamed up or um, like they have someone who uh, teams up with them when it comes to like producing those books. But Stephen King, he writes his books all by himself, so. That's a really good feat for him. Yeah, and I encourage anyone, so if anyone wants to learn more about Stephen King and his writing process, because as you said, he is, he is extremely prolific. Yeah. <clears throat> read, um, read On Writing by Stephen King. It's a, it's a fantastic book that talks a lot about the craft of writing and it's brilliant. Right. Interestingly, he also talks in there about, so Stephen, Stephen King wouldn't be the person he is without his partner, his wife, Tabitha. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So he wrote Carrie, which is his first publication, mm -hmm. and he was getting rejections for it everywhere. He wasn't getting anywhere with it. So he yeah. threw it in the bin. Mm -hmm. And then his wife picked it up and mm -hmm. read it and was like, no, you're doing something with this because it's really good. Yeah. So I, I, I think there's a lesson in there. So to, to lean on the people who are close to you and, and when you're feeling that self-doubt about yourself, you, mm -hmm. you know, you're feeling worried, you're feeling like, you know, nothing you write is, is ever any good and you're just going to give it up. Mm -hmm. Maybe pass it on to someone else and let them give you an objective point of view of, of what you're writing. Make sure it's objective, though. And I believe his, his wife is quite objective of um, some of the stuff that she says to him. Definitely. But make sure it's an, an objective point of view. Someone you trust, someone who knows books, mm -hmm. someone who knows story. Mm -hmm. Give it to them and then see, see what happens. And don't just, don't just dismiss your, your entire writing talent, you know. Definitely. And um, it's also like an opportunity if, if you have like a writer connections, right? Because um, they can also give like what you said, objective feedback. Um, in the UK, a lot of writers emerged in, the, in history, in the history of modern literature. We have the likes of J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, um, J.K. Rowling, and many others. And um, yeah, um, when uh, like a little trivia though, I was when I was in high school, I was reading um, Tolkien and Lewis at the same time. And then I just, I, I just found out that they were also like, not only um, colleagues, but friend, close friends. Um, they had this group, The Inklings. I think they formed it in Oxford, mm. somewhere in, in England. And then um, oh, you that's know that. when they, yeah, that's when they talked about their ideas. And I, I, I don't know, but um, for, for some reason, um, they also share the same interests when it comes to genre. Um, Tolkien is into fantasies, uh, fantasy, and then uh, Lewis is also into fantasy as well. But Lewis is more of like theological. Um, his works are, are lean more in the um, theology rather than Tolkien, who is more into like a direct fantasy. He doesn't want his he didn't want his works to be considered um, uh, like allegories, unlike um, Lewis. But anyway. Um, that's for a history lesson. So um, back to Feral Snow, Mark. Um, you also integrated the um, uh, idea of like, or the representation of the different abled community. As an educator for um, different abled um, children, um, how do we um, as like people or like as um, people who have um, common or like normal functioning abilities, uh, how, how do we support them? Because um, for you as a writer, you've already done that. You've um, written a novel representing um, someone from their community. And how, how do we like, um, as like normal people or like a, a people who, like if there are other people who are out there who, who don't really necessarily have to write a novel about them, how, how can we um, uh, support them? Either by um, joining uh, non-government organizations, um, like, holding events or stuff like that? So I don't think there's necessarily anything that you need to do in that sense. You know, you don't need to, to, to do anything big. It's nothing, you know, they, there are voluntary organizations and charities out there. And if you could support them, that'd be absolutely, absolutely amazing. There are certain, certainly there are things that you can, do. As, a, as a writer, as, as someone who works in the creative industry, um, representation is absolutely massive. It's huge. Mm. And there are very little books that I read so far with someone who has a sensory impairment. Um, the the Tuva Moodyson series by Will Bean is, is, I don't know if you've, you've, you've read it, but it is amazing in terms of um, how to, you know, in terms of a, a deaf person's experience of life and functioning. And Tuva is, a, is an incredible character in that she is very, um, she's very, she's blunt she's she's just believable she's a really well-rounded character she's great she's got good depth mm -hmm. um so i think if you can get the representation in there on those kinds of levels and it's, it's the same with anything though it's the same with it's the same with race it's the same with um with uh, abilities and and anything if there's a representation there for people for young children especially for them to look up to and to see you know a deaf character who's in a book, who's in a movie, who's, you know, A Quiet Place, for example, had a leading deaf character in that story as a movie. Mm -hmm. And she, that, that actor was, was incredible. And the story was incredible. Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah, if there's that representation, fantastic, because it allows it allows people to sort of get used to it. Right. And that's a hor- that's a horrible thing to say, but there are, there are certain children out there that, that won't go until you know they're until about twenty years of age or, or even later, where they'll never have come across someone who is um, not neuro- neurotypical or what have you. Um, there are certain things that we can do on a you know on a social level, you know, when you're talking to them and stuff. For for deaf people specifically, their concentration levels can sometimes waver a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's because they're tired. It's understandable. They're trying to read your lips, and if you're talking. Um, you know, accents sometimes can be a little bit difficult for them if you're covering your mouth and stuff when you're talking to them. Obviously, it gets muffled and everything, but they also can't read your lips and not access in that same level of, of language as everyone else. Um, so, you know, especially in the pandemic that we've got at the moment, face masks are, are an absolute nightmare for, for deaf people. So there are some clear face coverings that you can get. Really simple ones is just like a plastic window that goes here that allows them to see your lips moving. It doesn't, you know, so it's in little, little tiny things like that where, you know, you, we have politicians and stuff who, who run the country who don't wear clear face masks. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's beyond me why, you know? And it's, it's, it's difficult because you come across someone who, for example, is in a wheelchair. You, you can see that there's a, there's a physical, there's a, there's a physical challenge there for them when it comes to ascending steps, for example. Mm-hmm. So you know how to, you, you know, you install a ramp. Something like that, which is a really basic thing, but it's something physical, it's something tangible that people can see and go, that's how we fix it. So to speak, it depends on obviously on the person. Whereas deafness is, is quite an incidental thing, it's low level, which means that you can't see if someone's deaf. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, all that language that you that you would do on an like, you know, it, it depends on how you communicate with people, but if you turn your head to the side, for example, then, you're, then that person is missing out on a lot of language from you. Um, and they're not getting the full message and they're getting frustrated and they're losing that concentration. And then that kind of isolates them a little bit as well. Yeah. So what I will say is, is an, in, a, in a wider sense, in a wider world kind of sense, that representation and those little things that people can do, you know, in terms of the, the face masks or in terms of representation within um, movies and books and all of that stuff, that's what we should be aspiring to in a wider world sense. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of a social level, just, and also language as well, how you, how you speak to them, how you communicate to them, the words that you use, you need to be very specific about it and don't, you know, because, because they are, they're a proud community and rightly so, because they're amazing people and therefore they need that, they, they should have that respect from other people Right. as as anyone should really because there's nothing there's nothing wrong with them they're not they're not not normal you know they're just they just go about things a different way and that's okay and we should be more accepting of that and more um fluid in our approach to communication and language because that is essential and especially as especially educators as well because for young children they need to see that I will adapt the way that I communicate so that you can access the language that I'm producing. And therefore the child is then gonna grow up to be a bit more confident, a bit happier, a bit more included. And therefore, you know, and that, that's, that's the aim, isn't it? To, to make sure that they're all happy and that they're, um, they're getting what they need. Right. And it's, um, it, it's a great opportunity for your child also because your child will also get to learn um, sign language from you when when you uh, when you both ha- have the opportunity to like teach um, your child your newborn child. Is, he, is is your child a girl or a boy? A boy, Freddie. Oh, that's good. That's so he's a son. Yeah, he's only five and a half weeks old. But wow. even then, you know, you've got you, you've got your basic communication skills, which are coming, which every parent does. Right. Every parent does. Mm-hmm. Um, eye contact, you know, making sure they can see your entire face, facial expressions, changing your intonation and your accent when you're reading them a book, when you're reading them a story, you know, mm-hmm. going into different accents and stuff or putting on a high pitch voice or a low voice or anything. It's, it's essential because it, it's, and you do that with your baby anyway. So even if your baby is, if your baby is deaf or you, if whatever, you know, just, just everything's, everything's cool. Just keep to it. You just need to do a little bit more of it. That's all. And yeah, if you want to introduce sign language, that's fine. But it's not necessarily 
a given that all deaf people learn or want to know or communicate through uh, through sign language mm -hmm. because some of them get by absolutely fine in there you know by talking lip reading or what have you some of them don't need it some of them don't want to do it it's cool it's, it's what have you it's, it's each individual person i will be teaching my son some uh, some sign language and then if he wants to learn more he learns more that's great um and i think that it should be Sign language should be something that's taught in schools a lot more. Right. Um, we have certain hand cues and signals and stuff like that, which sort of let children know certain things. Why not communicate, you know, whole words through it? It's, you know, it's beyond me why we don't teach it, at, uh, especially at secondary level, you know, in terms of teenagers and stuff. Why not? It allows them to access, it allows them to communicate with people who would otherwise struggle to communicate with them. So. Right. And we'll look forward to that day when, you know, those kind of like, um, at least little steps will be recognized so that we can have like an inclusive community to like represent them and to also, you know, um, um, defy stereotypes. So um, lastly, Mark. Um, yeah. Yeah. What is your advice to writers who might be interested in taking the self-publishing um, path or like route that you are taking now? Research. Okay. Do you do your research? I mean, so I, I self-published and I kind of went into it with an idea that because um, I'm on a low budget, you know, I've got mm -hmm. a, a, we've just spoken about, I've got a newborn, so I don't really want to spend a lot of money on paid advertisements and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't got the money for it and, and I, I don't, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fine balance, isn't it? But So when you write your story and you think, oh, I'm going to self-publish this, look into what what would what works best for other writers other self-published writers do your research read into them listen to their podcasts because there are thousands out there who, who produce podcasts who quite happily talk about self-publishing you know it's, it's, it's a great community mm -hmm. um so when i first when i first published feral snow i i did a, a giveaway where i gave away like you know four or five books or something that inspired the writing of feral snow um, and I thought, oh, it'd be great. It's like worth 40 quid or something like that, 40 pounds. I was thinking, oh, it'd be great. I'll get loads of people who will purchase for our snow because all they had to do was send me a confirmation of purchase um, for just the ebook. Right. Um, and it didn't, it didn't as well as I thought it would. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you still have to hold true to the, the fact that you've held a competition and you should still sends the winner those books which mm -hmm. is great i got a few sales out of it but not as many as i thought it would so well i just as you you'll go into it and especially with your first book you'll go into it and you, you'll grow you'll learn stuff and the things that i wish that i learned very early on were things like there are influence out there influencers out there for a reason there are people out there who have thousands of followers because they read and read and read and read and read get in touch with them network talk to them and see how can i how can i work with you to make my book more accessible mm -hmm. more well known to others right. so there are a couple of people that I, were, I did a blog tour um which as i said got me a, a big spike in in sales which is fantastic um partly not, be, not necessarily because the, the not necessarily because the, the, the money side of it as I said some of those were, were free book sales but also just because i wanted i wanted for snow out there I wanted people to read it because I was, it was something that I was incredibly proud of. Um, See, so yeah, I worked. I worked with. A, a, I did the blog tour, which got me, you know, really great reviews as well to work with. Reviews are essential. If you can get reviews off of people, don't push them too much because ultimately it's their own decision. But if you can get reviews off of people, then you're gold because you can use those. If you, if you, before you buy a product, I always look at the reviews first because you want to know if the product is worth buying. Hard-earned money, you work all week for it. You want to know if you're spending it on something good. So yeah, the blog tour was worth it, really worth it. Um, and then afterwards, I, I hooked up with a couple of um, other influencers and stuff who I just got in contact with, just sent them a free book. But you know, who's, is, I don't mind sending, sending free stuff to people. Mm -hmm. um, 
I shouldn't say that too loud because you know people should buy it. Um, but yes, I, so I sent them I sent a couple of free books out there and they read it. And the, 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 the interesting thing is I've got I'm not you know, the fact that they were able to share it with other people is great. The more important thing was that they actually loved it and they told me that they loved it and they actually responded to me yeah through private messaging and then they released it wide you know wide descents on, on Twitter or what have you. Um, and that was worth more to me than like a hundred sales because it's, it's this person, these people, you know, bloggers and influencers and stuff who read and read and read and read and read. And I've had it, I'm having some of them tell me that Frail Snow is their favorite book of the year. Wow. You know, and this is towards the end of the year. So they've had 12 months of reading, yeah. you know? So it's, it's, I, those, those are essential. If you can get reviews, hook up with some influencers and stuff who have thousands of followers, just be nice to them, just talk to them. And if they say no, then they say no, be respectful of that though, mm -hmm. right? Because they, they're busy people. They have lives of their own as well as the fact that they read for other people and stuff. They accept um, publications from traditional publishers as well. Yeah. So, um, and also there are authors out there who the, the writing community is such a supportive, lovely place to be in. Mm -hmm. There are authors out there who you need, you need, you need to build a, a, a base of authors who you just rely on and turn to. <clears throat> there are people who are so Stu Turton, for example, like you know, I can talk to him. Matt Bezalovsky, he reviewed um, Frail Snow for me. Talk to him. Sharon Bearden, who whose uh, debut Sins of the Father has come out recently, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, she reviewed Frail Snow as well. And she she loved it. She absolutely loved it, and she produced a, a quote for it as well. You know, there are people out there who you can get in touch with. Will Carver is another one who um, is accepting it as well to have a little read. There are, there, are, there, are, there are big name authors out there as well who mm -hmm. care about the little guy, who will care about you if you go into, out into the world and you publish. I remember Stu Turton messaged me on, um, on publication day for Feral Snow because I believe it was the same publication day as, as Devil in the Dark Water. Mm -hmm. But he took the time to message me and to say, how are you feeling? How is it going? You know? And Stu is an incredible guy, an incredible writer, and he is on the up and up and up and up and up because his books are amazing, and rightly so. But the fact that he took the time to message me and just to say, how is, how's it going, how are you feeling about it, was just incredible. Mm -hmm. And that just goes to show that not necessarily just big name authors, you know, there are lots of self-published people out there. There are lots of people who are trying to be public or self-published, and they're in, they're in those trenches of stuff. They're incredible people out there. And if you network with them correctly and use social them, yeah. Do you the world one afraid about your story? Ultimately it's it's gonna be worth sharing if you think it is. So that's nice. Yeah. So networking is is a key to um author success and also um to reach out to other um authors and um, publishers and self-publishers as well. So thank you very much, Mark, for your time. And thank you very much for um, explaining to um, me and my little viewers so far <laughs> um, the plot and the theme of Feral Snow. Once again, guys, um, Mark Willis, I will link his um, book in the description below. And um, if you have any inquiries, please um, post them on the comment section below this video. So thank you once again, Mark, and have a great day. Thank you.